Welcome to Canadian Justice. I'm Christine Van Gyne, and today we're doing part two of our episodes about domestic abuse and children. This episode includes details of the case, which may be distressing for some viewers. In our last episode, I told you the story of Kira. Kira's father was a well-established domestic abuser who had subjected his ex-wife to disturbing levels of physical and emotional abuse. In spite of this history of abuse, and in spite of Kira's mother raising the alarm about his escalating and erratic behavior, Kira's father was granted unsupervised access to his daughter. Kira's mother asked for his access to be cut off, but the court deemed that the matter was not urgent. Ten days after that hearing, Kira's father killed her in a murder-suicide. In our last episode, we spoke to Kira's mother, Jennifer, about her journey and battle to change the law in Canada so other children can't be victimized the way Kira was. Today, we're joined by two of Jennifer's lawyers, Catherine Marshall and Justin Linden. Thank you both so much for joining today. Catherine, I wanted you to sort of do a recap of the facts leading up to Kira's murder. Uh, Jennifer had brought an urgent motion to change custody, to, to restrict access, actually. Um, so what was happening that led her to ask for that change? There was a lot of escal escalation in the behavior that um, her Jennifer's ex husband was exhibiting, and it was um, dangerous behavior and very upsetting. And you know, it, there were a lot of red flags. So she had brought this urgent application to um, limit um, access um, to to super to have it be supervised uh, and. You know, this is just this whole case is a complete failure of the system from the beginning to the end. Justin, one of the things that was happening at that time was that the, the judge had had involved Jewish Community Family Services and asked for them to do an investigation. Um, so what was happening with that investigation by that family organization in the days leading up to the murder? So JF and CS had a caseworker that was involved in the case. And actually, just before the murder, she revealed to the family, uh, and in fact, it's in a recorded conversation, that she subsequently confirmed having this discussion. She revealed to the family that she felt that the father was exhibiting behavior consistent with a parent that kills a child. We understand she spoke with her supervisor, and instead of immediately taking the child into custody from the father, which they had the power to do, a decision was made to deal with it after the weekend. And unfortunately, it's that weekend when the child was murdered. So on the Friday, they formed this impression that this, this man is acting in a manner consistent with a parent that kills a child, and they decide it can wait until Monday. And of course, Sunday happens, and that's when the child's killed. So they, they had this email exchange saying this man is a risk of killing his daughter, and they still did not intervene. This is part of the basis for a, uh, a claim in negligence that, that Jennifer is, is, has, is making a, against that family services organization. Um, what can you tell us about that, about that lawsuit? Yeah, so it's a verbal exchange. What happens is the caseworker tells this uh, you know, to the mother and the father in advance. That's my understanding. That's the information we have. We know she meets with her supervisor and we know they discuss what to do. And, and they had the power to take action. So one of the key elements of our lawsuit is their failure to use the power and authority that they had. They didn't require a court order at that point. Once they formed the opinion that that child is in immediate risk of harm, they have the authority to simply go and take the child, period, full stop, end of story. And deciding to let it sit over the weekend really is one of the key heads of the lawsuit. There are other failures, but that's the most important because when it really reached that fever pitch, they could have stepped in. They had the power to step in. We say they knew they should have stepped in, and they decide to let it go over the weekend. And unfortunately, a child's life can't wait over the weekend. So can you tell us briefly about the status of that lawsuit? How much is it for, and how is it progressing? So the next step is examinations for discovery, where we'll have an opportunity to question under oath that caseworker and her supervisor, and also to get full production of all their internal documents, because we don't have all their internal documents presently. And, and I think the, the claim is for, I think, $16.5 million, but um, obviously it's, it's really not about the money. It's about the failure by this organization, allegedly to protect a child when they knew she was going into the home of a person who they themselves, based on what you're saying, have identified as a, a risk to her life. 
We've got to go to commercial break, but when we come back, I want to talk to you, Catherine, specifically about some of the changes to the law that are being proposed by Akira's mother and stepfather and how those proposed changes could prevent a tragedy like this from happening in the future. Welcome back to Canadian Justice, where we're discussing how the family law system failed a four-year-old girl named Kira, who was murdered by her abusive father, and some proposed changes to the law. Now, Catherine, what can you tell me about Kira's law, what it proposes, and, and what the progress of those proposed changes is? The main element of Kira's law um, is that it's proposing that judges receive domestic violence training. And um, it surprises a lot of people to know that judges don't um, get a ton of training uh, when they're appointed. They, they'll have some training about like, you know, how to make decisions and how to hear evidence and how to really be efficient when writing their judgments. But those are more like process things. They don't get a ton of other types of training. And so Kira's law proposes that judges do receive domestic violence training so that they can better um, understand uh, what red flags are and what to look out for and why it's really dangerous to have a child in the custody of someone who's exhibiting behavior consistent with um, a murderer or someone who will commit a murder or someone who, who will commit abuse. And uh, that's the, the primary goal of Kira's Law. It's currently working its way through the parliamentary system. It will be going to committee, uh, a committee for debate. Um, and uh, the hope, of course, is that this passes and it will, I think, absolutely make a difference in the lives of children. It will save children's lives if judges have this training. Could you, could you tell us what, the tra what this training would actually look like? I, I know you mentioned some red flags. Maybe you could tell our viewers what some of those red flags are. So uh, one of the issues in, in family law, and I'm not a family lawyer, but I have a lot of family lawyer friends, and my dad was actually a family lawyer for many years. So I, I'm accustomed to, to looking at these types of cases. And one of the primary issues is that there's a really strong um, bias, of course, to maintaining um, a, a access a, that a child would have to a parent. And that exists even in cases where an individual has been abusive to, to their ex-partner. And um, what happens is in these cases, judges will hear all kinds of evidence about abuse, about abuse in the marital home, uh, you know, financial abuse, emotional abuse, verbal abuse, physical abuse, stalking, um, all kinds of horrible behavior, and they will uh, still grant custody and access to the person who's exhibiting this behavior because they'll say, well, you know, they, they weren't abusive to the child. That reasoning is the result of someone not being educated about um, the, the, the psychology and the behavior of abusers. And that if, and there's a whole body of evidence that shows that if someone has engaged in abusive conduct, they are highly likely to be abusive to the child, especially because the child becomes a pawn and a means for control. And, um, People don't know these things unless they've, they've learned it. It's not something that you just pick up through osmosis. And lawyers, lawyers don't pick this up. Judges will, you will not learn this unless you hear from the experts. And there's just so much, I think, um, bias and stereotyping that exists. And one thing I hear, Christine, uh, from a lot of women who talk to me, and this is something that I'm very concerned about, is that... Um, Women are being told by family law mediators not to bring up abuse during their, uh, their court proceedings because there is a bias that exists in the family court system that people fabricate those allegations in order to get back at their exes and get what they want. And we, get, we end up with situations like what happened with Kira. You know, Justin, I, I, I want to turn to you for the time we have left for this. Um, 
the Jewish community or the Jewish family community services um, had had um, originally tasked this case file at some point to quite a junior person um, who who also seemed to fail at recognizing the signs of abuse. Can, what can you tell us about that and how it fits into your case? I mean, at our discovery, which is going to come up in the fall, we're obviously going to probe into the education and training of these people. It, it seems to us there should have been people involved who had specific training in how to deal with individuals who they perceive will commit violent acts. They knew the whole history of this case. They knew that this fellow had abused his wife physically and sexually. They knew that he was engaged in proper conduct with the daughter. He wouldn't let her go home. He was being deceptive. He was deceiving right. the court. They knew, and that, that for us is key in this case. Welcome back to Canadian Justice, where we're discussing how the family law system failed a four-year-old girl named Kira, who was murdered by her abusive father. Uh, Catherine Jennifer, uh, Kira's mother, her case involved physical violence against her by her ex-husband, but it, it also involved something called coercive control. Can you explain what that is? Coercive control is when someone engages in a pattern of conduct um, designed to control the person using fear. And a lot of people, when they think about domestic violence, they immediately envision physical violence and a lot of domestic violence is physical. But I think most domestic violence, or at least the cases that I am exposed to and hear about, uh, primarily involve coercive control. And that includes behavior like controlling finances, cutting someone off from their family, threatening them, making them, basically making them live in fear. And um, is actually one of the reasons why a lot of uh, primarily women don't leave abusive relationships when they have children, because they are afraid what is gonna happen to their children if they leave the relationship and they no longer are there all the time to protect their child, because they know the court system is gonna grant their abusive partner access. And it becomes this terrible cycle. Do you think that Kira's law would help judges to learn how to identify coercive control and, and help use identifying that as, as a decision-making factor in custody cases? Definitely. Um, this is not going to be window dressing type um, education. It, you know, the, the, the goal is to get um, professionals in and, and get them giving seminars to judges and other people who work in the family law system. It's not just judges. You've got all you've got mediators. You have all kinds of people who are form part of the family law system because settlement is a huge part of the family system. So, um, there are people who um, are psychologists, people who study this type of behavioral pattern for a living, and they'll be able to teach judges about it so that when they're hearing all this evidence and they're hearing all this horrible stuff and hearing all this, these weird behavioral things, they're able to put together, you know, hey, this is a pattern of behavior that is going to likely lead to a horrible, horrific event, and I'm going to stop that from happening by laying down the law. Justin, in this case, a lot of um, Kira's father's behavior was designed to hurt Jennifer, so his, his ex-wife. So how common is it for an abusive parent, um, once the spouses have separated, to use their child as a way of continuing to abuse their partner? I mean, I think, unfortunately, it happens that they weaponize the child, you know, unknowingly. The child doesn't really understand what's going on, but in a case like this, that's exactly what happened. So it happens, unfortunately, too often, and, and the signs become very clear, and the signs were there to be seen. I mean, it was clear to everybody what was going on. Yeah, and if only there had been an intervention, the intervention that Jennifer had been seeking. Um, and now, Justin, I also wanted to touch on how the pandemic has impacted uh, or exacerbated concerns around family violence? I mean, I think there's a huge mental health crisis out there. You've had people living under, you know, health restrictions for a long time. People haven't been able to go out. It's just been a tough time. So I think there are many cases where it's just boiled over. So, I, you know, fortunately we're coming out of it, but it's been a dangerous and tough time for a lot of people. Now, now Catherine, with respect to Kira's law, in, in 
In their case, the judge who made this decision related to um, the, the urgent order to, to uh, remove access for her father the, right before she was killed, that judge, his background was an employment lawyer. And, and of course, no, no, <laughs> no knocking employment lawyers, Catherine. I know it's the area you practice in. But um, is it common for judges in one area of law who have expertise in one area of law to hear cases, very important cases, in a totally different area of law? It is common. And for the most part, that's actually a really good function of our system because it is good to have judges who don't have, you know, certain um, entrenched beliefs or biases about certain areas of law. You know, if you have a judge who only practice insurance defense and they're only hearing insurance defense cases, they're going to view it a certain way. You know, they're going to view it with their lawyer lens. So I think it's good that you have judges who don't necessarily have a background in criminal law hearing criminal cases. But the unique thing about family law is that in many ways, it's it's not law. In, oh, you wanted to... <laughs> we, we, we've got to go to commercial break, Catherine, yeah. but, but I want to let you finish when we come back um, yeah. about what you're, what, what you're saying right now. Welcome back to Canadian Justice, where we're discussing proposed changes to family law. Um, Catherine, I wanted to give you a chance to finish what you were saying in the last segment about judges who have expertise in one area, hearing cases in another, and how that applies in the family law context. Yeah, family uh, family cases are a different beast, to be honest. it's There's no other area of law that's so personal, and you're hearing some of the worst things you might have ever heard. And... Um, the notion that family judges should have some specialized training and expertise, I think, is really uh, warranted because of the type of issues they're dealing with. They're de and they're dealing with children and protecting children and minors. And um, it's not something that you could just, I think, walk into without any experience or training. So one of the things that I have been hearing, some of the commentary around legislation, not just this piece of legislation, but other proposed legislation like training for um, judges in sexual assault cases, some of the commentary has been that if the legislature requires these judges to get that training, there's sort of a intrusion into the judiciary's independence. So judicial independence is very important. If the legislature dictates that judges must receive that training, does that violate at all the principle of judicial independence, Catherine? I think it's a fair criticism and I understand where it's coming from. But at the same time, I also think it's coming from a place where people don't necessarily understand the really complex very, very personal issues that these judges are dealing with. And the reality is most child abductions in, that happen, it's a, it's a, a strange parent. Um, child homicides happen in really, really terrible divorce situations where there are so many red flags. Um, and there are ways to prevent these things from happening. And is incumbent on our system to, to do this. And I don't think it's gonna open some crazy floodgate of like, oh, well, you know, judges should get training in every single other element. You know, maybe maybe there will, there will be more people who come forward and say, well, my issue, you know, our issue is also important. But, you know, um, this particular issue, it's just been, it, it has, Kira's case has highlighted how horrible it is, but it is so common. It is so common. So I have the same question for you, Justin. How do you respond to this criticism that the legislature can't order training for judges? Which I, I want to make clear, this is not a, about the bill as a concept. I think all of us probably agree that someone hearing a case about domestic violence should understand what domestic violence looks like. But it's sort of this high-level principled criticism. So what's your response to that, Justin? Yeah, I mean, I think the judiciary would probably welcome the opportunity to have this specialized training and expertise. Uh, they're being educated about psychology and, and how parents behave in certain situations. So I, I actually don't see it as a problem. And I think my guess is the judiciary would probably welcome the opportunity to have that, certainly would assist them in understanding cases and what's going on. 
And would this be like a, a spending bill as well? Would it come with proposed funding to train the judges or would it come out of the existing budget? I mean, I don't know that it's been that refined in terms of the funding source, but you know, whatever the cost, if it saves the next Kira, it's worth every nickel. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I wanna thank both of you for coming on today. It's a really difficult topic to have a, a conversation about, but it's such an important one. And I wanna thank you both so much for coming on today, sharing your views about this, addressing some of that criticism head on and being so clear eyed about all of this. Thank you, Catherine Marshall and Justin Linden so much for your time today. Thanks so much. Thank you. We've heard today about the tragic and preventable death of a young child at the hands of her abusive father and how the family law system let her down. We've also heard about changes to the law that could help prevent another tragedy like Kira's by requiring family law training for judges. We've also heard about some of the debate around that proposed law, whether requiring such training intrudes into the independence of the judiciary. What do you think? Do family law judges need better training in domestic abuse? Or does that violate the principle of the separation of powers? You be the judge. Thanks for watching, and remember, a freer Canada starts with you.